It's a pleasure to be here. It's my second trip to ANSTO, and uh, I think we've already had a very interesting, intriguing, and exciting morning of, of interaction. Um, the, uh, I think the sort of basic premise of, of, of having this day and this lecture is uh, to try to connect up as many of these uh, sort of pan-Australian research agencies as possible. And uh, this one, of course, is a very uh, well-established and very well-respected and highly regarded uh, uh, Australian research uh, agency. Um, the one I'm going to tell you about is, is, is in its infancy. It's actually uh, in a gestational stage. But I think that um, it's always fun to watch things from the beginning. And so I'm hoping that you'll share my excitement in, in what we're trying to do. So I'm going, to, um, it, I'm going to give you a brief overview of uh, what uh, it means for Australia to become part of the EMBL uh, sort of international scientific family, uh, give you a background on EMBL, which indeed has a very uh, physics bent to its, uh, and, and, and a, a structures bent to its uh, inception, and then try to connect the dots a little bit and, and try to uh, do a little crystal ball gazing about wh where we might end up if we uh, talked long enough to Together. So this has all been precipitated by a new venture, which is to connect uh, Europe uh, with Australia in a new way. Not that we haven't had many connections in the past, but the idea is that uh, the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, about which I'll tell you uh, some more in a minute, consisting of 20 member states, which includes Israel as well as the contiguous European states, most of which now have been subsumed into the European Union. Um, this was founded in 1974. I hear it was three men in a pub, actually. Uh, I, I'm sure if Kendrew was around, it would have been in a pub. Um, it was a, uh, there was a Frenchman who, and a German whose names I can't remember, but Kendrew was the, was the Brit in the group. And they were, they, were depl uh, they, they were crying into their beer about how they were losing all their best scientists to America, because at the time, molecular biology was obviously still coming out of a real physics background. If you think about the pioneers of molecular biology, many of them were chemists and physicists. And uh, they uh, were seeing all their brightest students run off on this uh, joyride to go to America where they could do all this fancy molecular biology. So they decided they had to do something to make Europe look attractive to these young stars, to keep them in their countries of origin, or at least at this, on that side of the Atlantic. And so they decided to use the CERN model, as you heard, by prov providing young people right out of their postdoctoral experience before they'd actually proven themselves to the extent that they could write very large grants or um, attract the best students. Give them the chance to uh, do their research as if they had all the money they needed, which they would have because this would be given to them, and that they would get the best students because the emphasis would be on a, on a program of, of, uh, of training which would emphasize the, uh, the, stu the best student going to the youngest rather than the most senior of these people. And then the third most important quality was the fact that this would only go on for a maximum of nine years, after which point they would be given their little stick and their little handkerchief and they would have been told to go find their fortune because their space was needed by the next group of young postdocs who were looking for this uh, golden opportunity. And of course, this was like a dream come true for anyone who got one of these positions. And it still is a dream come true 40 years later. And it's based on these ba uh, uh, basic principles that, that Embel really came uh, into being and now has been copied all over the world and we're hoping to copy it in Australia. In order to do this, we had to sign up Australia as a member of EMBL. Well, that's sort of like, well, it's European Molecular Biology Australia. But um, I tried the Australian Molecular Biology Laboratory, and nobody wanted that because they wanted EMBL because it has it's a brand name and they know what it is and they said just call it EMBL Australia. In any case, that was all what uh, in under the bridge because ultimately what we were able to do was to convince both EMBL and the uh, Australian government, as well as a few very forward-minding universities and CSIRO, to put up the funds to join EMBL as its first associate member, which is as almost as good as being a full member. It's just that because it's so far away, there are certain aspects of full membership which wouldn't make sense and for which Australia should not pay. So the, the current com, uh, uh, content of the EMBL Australia network includes 
Uh, the group of eight universities, as well as CSIRO, who have all signed up to be part of the Emble family. And uh, the uh, whole question might come to you, well, wh why would these august organizations team up um, to, to do this? And the, the reason um, is because uh, Emble uh, actually came to them. Well, it, it was through me, but it didn't take long before the rest of Emble caught the, the, the idea. And these were the qualities of Australian science, current Australian science, that Emble really recognized as a reason to engage this country in their um, uh, vision for interdisciplinary and collaborative research. First of all, th there's a, a, an incredible amount of life sciences going on in this country, far more than the per capita would, would uh, dictate. Um, there's an extraordinarily well-developed uh, medical research base and clinical trials are very well conducted here and they're very easy to do. Um, there is a, a national culture of research recognition and support after uh, seeing Swan's report this morning. I should have taken that part out of the slide, but let's just assume that <laughs> life will continue post Armageddon. Um, there's a, uh, a, I think, an impressive amount of infrastructure in this country. I mean, I'm sitting in the middle of some of it, but also I think uh, the the whole uh, NCRIS initiative to try to build infrastructure into the scientific fabric of this country has really been a trendsetter, and certainly we could have done with that in Europe a lot sooner. Um, the uh, uh, federated nation part is quite is quite important because EMBL had to cobble together the support from a number of member countries. At the time, there was no Europe. I mean, it was loosely called that, but I mean, France didn't necessarily feel warm and fuzzy towards England. And, and not that they do now, but at least they're contributing to EMBL. And they're both contributing to EMBL. And they did it, they decided to do this on a per uh, a GDP basis. So th they were able to attract up to tw uh, 12 original member countries who contributed to EMBL in this way. And now it's 20, it's grown slowly, but convincing 20 member states to come together and agree unanimously, which is part of the charter, on a number of different issues surrounding the, the running and the um, organization uh, and the governance of EMBL is a, a, a diplomatic feat, the likes of which, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a daunting one. And uh, although I'd say that going from, you know, Victoria to New South Wales to Western Australia reminds me a little bit about go from going to Portugal to Norway to Spain, but, but in, in many ways the, the fact that this is a federated country makes it easier for us to think about ways in which to do uh, uh, something nationally. Um, and then finally, we noticed that Australia was interested in seeking more uh, ties with Europe, where most of its focus had been on America when, uh, over the last 10 years when the whole scientific scene in America became somewhat problematic because of the funding and the global financial crisis, we sensed that uh, Australia might be as interested in, fo in forming new ties with European scientists as it had been to America. And then uh, the loss of young talent, of course. So let me tell you a little bit about what EMBL uh, was, uh, is all about so you can see why Australia wanted to get involved with EMBL, not the other way around. So uh, there are five centers for EMBL. We call them branches or nodes or campuses or outstations, which I, I think is very funny because, you know, having an outstation in Rome, um, you know, Australian, so you think of an outstation as something, you know, far, far west of Alice Springs. So it, it's, a, it's a little bit different. In this case, the uh, headquarters is in Heidelberg. Probably many of you have uh, visited uh, either the Hamburg or the Grenoble uh, stations because that's where the two big synchrotrons are in Europe, and these are two structural biology uh, uh, centers which, uh, for, with which probably many of you have collaborations already. Uh, the Sanger Center is the next uh, in line, and that one is um, a uh, European Bioinformatics Institute that is um, part of EMBL, but sits inside of the Sanger uh, Genome Campus and works directly with the Sanger. So that's a very strong uh, bioinformatics network, and anyone who's ever um, uh, uh, logged on to UniProt knows, knows what, what that's all about. And then finally, the one that I've been running, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, giving it up uh, this year, but it, up until now I've been running this mouse biology program, um, has a focus on the um, mechanisms of disease in mouse models of human pathologies. So as I said, it's, a, it's, a, it's an institute that was started over oh, 40 or so years ago. It has now become a top research institute. I'll show you the metrics, but it's very, it's very impressive. 
Um, and it has its own PhD program, which has now become quite famous around the world and is copied widely. Um, it's about uh, 1,400 people. Those are spread out over those five different areas. And in order for us to uh, make sure that we are actually integrating all of the structural biology, the physical biology, the information biology, the systems biology, and then the wet lab biology together, um, we meet all the time, and that's absolutely critical. So the senior membership of EMBL, the leadership, we get together at least six times a year formally and get together more often than that informally. And um, so I'm a big believer in showing up. So I mean, that's why I've dragged a whole bunch of people up from Melbourne today, because there's nothing like sitting and having lunch with someone to really figure out what that person is doing. Here's just the member states, so you can see that most of the uh, European member states that are now part of the EU are involved, as well as Switzerland and, uh, and Israel, etc., Iceland. And um, the, it's growing. Um, Croatia is the newest one, and I think Czechos the Czech uh, Republic is coming on board. So uh, the reason it's so attractive to these member states is because the mission has really remained unchanged over the last uh, 40 years. It's a basic research in biology. I would say molecular is a little outdated, but you know what I mean, not uh, ecology or, or uh, sort of um, uh, social biology. It's much more sort of a molecular biology focus. Uh, there is a very strong emphasis on essential services. We do as much in terms of services and training as we do in basic research. It's absolutely critical that we give back what we're getting. This rich uh, uh, package that we give to every group leader has to come from somewhere, and that money is actually coming from the combined contributions of the member states into a central pool. Two-thirds of all the funding for research and training and services at EMBL comes from this, this collective uh, budget. Uh, a third of it comes from external grants. We are uh, uh, one of the highest receivers of EU grants and uh, other uh, kinds of grants. And then finally, we do have a very strong instrumentation component. Uh, some of the microscopy that's been developed at EMBL over the years is now sort of common usage. Uh, there are other important uh, instrumentation advances in, in, in conjunction with structural biologists. And um, obviously, there's been an extraordinary ex um, explosion of genetics, a lot of which got started uh, at EMBL. And it's true that uh, the fly genetics really uh, sort of took off there. And then finally, we obviously have tech transfer. So what's it so special about this, and why is it that Australia wants to become part of it? I'm just going to try to f focus a little bit on the, on the essentials here. It's international, and that is very important. And I think that in some ways Australia is an inherently international uh, uh, country. Um, everyone's come from somewhere else for the most part, um, and uh, they are always looking out because of the isolation. So it feels to me very much like Europe here. Um, I think that there are an inc incredible emphasis on external collaborations, which is something that um, Australia could do more with. I think that's something that Australia could actually do a lot better with. And, uh, and finally, um, having access to the alumni is a very important thing because the EMBL alumni come through all the time because they're getting kicked out all the time. And so there's a very, very rich uh, collection of very fine scientists out there who you have direct contact with if you are from EMBL. Um, I don't have to say about interdisciplinarity, I think I've mentioned it, but these are people who actually do work together. And we have a, an interesting um, mechanism that's been recently thought up to uh, enhance and encourage this, and it's called interdisciplinary postdoctoral positions. So what we do is take part of that money that we get every year, and we put it into a pot, and we encourage uh, group leaders from different disciplines, so a structural biologist and an informatician, or a uh, developmental biologist and a chemist, would come together with a interesting collaborative project that they otherwise would not have done, and they propose it, and there's a deadline, and all our propositions go in, and an impartial judge, namely the director general, Ian Matai, um, spends an evening reading them all, and then decides which ones he's going to fund. Once those are decided, they go into a, an ad in Nature. Here are projects that you could apply for as a postdoc that you might be interested in doing. If you get this job, you will be working with this person from Grenoble and that person from Rome. 
Uh, then we get these very highly motivated students and, uh, who are looking for a postdoc that will actually teach them more than one discipline at a time. And uh, they come and spend part of their time in one lab, part of their time in the other lab. And it's been incredibly successful, not only in giving students an opportunity to do a postdoc that really does open horizons, but it also connects the dots between the faculty. So that's been very successful. Um, I don't have to point out why that's interesting. Um, and the fixed term contracts, I think, is an absolutely critical part of EMBL. Less than 11% of us have anything other than a fixed term contract. So I'm one of the leaders of EMBL, so at the moment I have what's called an open-ended contract, which means that every four years they decide whether I'm good enough to go on. But there is no nine-year limit. There are only a few people like that. And they're just as likely to be the head of a very important core facility as the head of an entire unit. So it really is all about what you do for the, un for the, for the uh, unity of the, of the organization, not so much how, how many papers you have in nature. However, the productivity is very good. And we do have a very high citation index. I think I've got it in a minute. Um, here it is. So we're, we're fourth in the world. Um, I'm not too upset about being behind Cold Spring Harbor, MIT, and the Salk, although, you know, it would be nice if we were third or second, but let's face it, there are some people below there that are pretty impressive, too. So I think we're doing all right. Um, and so this means that the system works, that the carrot, handing a young person the carrot rather than a stick of having to write an endless series of failed NHMRC grants, works. It actually gets people into their creative mood, taking risks on their science in a way that you can't do if you're um, trying desperately to satisfy the status quo. So, okay, this is how it works. How did we bring this to Australia? Where do we stand? What does this mean for research in Australia, for the researchers who might be interested in getting involved in EMBL Australia, and for people who can collaborate with us? Um, first of all, I'll just tell you the nuts and bolts of it. The first thing we did was to try to find um, interested members to come up with the eight million Australian dollars for seven years that it costs to join EMBL. That's a very, very low rate compared to what the normal membership would be. And uh, this was then uh, codified and EMBL Australia became an, uh, into existence and in September of 2009 we set up the council which is now running. Um, the most important component of becoming an, a member of EMBL was to be able to say that we could set up these laboratories where we would have people coming in with these wonderful packages. And we uh, called them the Partner Laboratory Network because we are partnershiped with EMBL. And the concept would be that these partners would um, uh, uh, help to, as they get developed, would ha help to reverse this brain drain. So here's just a sort of a picture of, I drew of what I'm hoping will happen eventually. So you, in Europe, EMBL, the member states, send their best and brightest through the EMBL program. Nine years later, the likelihood is that those people will go back into at least some member state, maybe not the same country, but they won't go away. Um, right now what happens is that a lot of uh, Australians seek an overseas postdoc and then they often get lost to the system and end up in another place. Or they just get depressed. So there's, an, there's another possibility here and that is that you might be able to do a similar thing that we're doing in Europe in Australia itself because let's face it, if you ask most Australians where they'd like to end up, it's here. It's not, you know, in Cleveland, Ohio. And so the, the possibility of retaining people through that vulnerable moment when they're most likely to seek an overseas appointment after a postdoc overseas, which is to totally reasonable, is this moment when they're right out of their postdoc. That's when you can catch them and bring them back in. But how do you do it? Because you don't, they don't have a track record yet. Maybe they went to a fantastic lab and got a great set of papers. But those people don't always actually persist because once they're out of that fantastic lab, they're not necessarily going to be able to keep up that level of excellence. And so the real trick to this is to pick the right people to go through this research group um, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, um, process and come out the other side with um, a, a really novel approach or an original approach uh, to science. And then hopefully they will have had such a wonderful time during their nine years as an EMBL Australia group leader that they'll think, uh, well, it'd be nice to stay in Australia and by definition they'll probably get a very good job in Australia. 
So, interlinked system of state-of-the-art facilities uh, in a number of places, and I'll show you that in a minute, generous fixed-term packages, and uh, the best PhD students we can attract um, to, to provide this model, which is hopefully sustainable. So how did we get it going in the first place? Well, uh, once we got the membership, then we had to get some money to run the thing. So we went to the uh, federal uh, government and said, uh, well, now that you've um, helped us to get this membership, we need you to help us to run the partner labs. And uh, in a very tough uh, environment, namely 2009, they gave us eight million over four years to start the establishment of a small number of groups. Um, and in this case, it was at Monash, which is the headquarters of Emble Australia. So uh, the idea would be that ultimately this eight million would be the seed to get a center in Monash, which would then spread to at least the University of Sydney, Queensland, and University of Western Australia, all of whom had contributed originally to the membership. Although there are all group of eight are involved, those four were the ones that came up first, so they get first dibs. And of course, CSIRO has been an incredible support uh, to us. Uh, not only did they contribute to the original associate membership, but they've also been extraordinarily collaborative and helpful along the way. So what kind of science are we going to do in these various uh, places? Well, you know, you, you put out a, a menu and see if, if, if people order from it. And at the moment, uh, the, the research themes that we chose uh, were chosen for a number of reasons. Some of them were because there was obvious expertise in the area some of which were because Emble didn't really have anything going in that area, and so they were excited about Australia taking that particular lead, and some of them were just out of necessity. Bioinformatics and computational biology, well, it's an explosion. We need to do something about it. So the regenerative medicine theme, which is the one that we've started on, um, it was born out of, uh, frankly, self-interest. I mean, I started it, so I decided to work on what I thought was interesting. But obviously, as, as you will um, see from the spread of the activities that the group leaders who have, the first group leaders who have come in, um, were, keep, were or holding this as a very loose definition. And in order to set up the right environment, we built an institute to house this activity called the Australian Regenerative Medicine Institute. And it's at Monash, and it's um, about a couple of years old, and it is about a, there are about 100 of us now. And the idea is to provide an environment where the questions around regenerative biology, stem cell biology, and the recapitulation of developmental processes for um, the maintenance of, of uh, form and function in biology um, are addressed with as many different approaches as possible. And uh, when, when we're trying to get money from the government, we say we're trying to cure every disease under the sun. But you know, you know what the real fact is. We're trying to figure out how it works. The problem, of course, is that these little guys, Planaria, can regenerate with an infinite capacity. You can cut these guys into a 1,000 pieces, and each one makes a new little planarium. Well, you can say that's not a very complicated thing to make. But they have some pretty interesting you know, capacity. Um, on a slightly more advanced evolutionary scale, um, the, uh, the famous salamander can regenerate incredibly well, cut off a limb, it grows back, cut the lens of an eye and it grows back, uh, cut off its tail, cut its jaw off, cut out its heart, it grows back and it grows back and it grows back. And then finally, there's us. I mean, not all, not all of us look quite like this, but at any rate, um, uh, even if you do... Um, uh, pump iron like crazy, you still end up losing 20% um, of your body mass and your muscle mass as you age. And that um, is something that obviously we would like to address, but also traumatic injuries and degenerative disease take their toll. So the question, you know, comes down to something very simple. I mean, this is what I tell people when they ask what's regenerative medicine. And I say, well, this guy can do it, this guy can't. I don't know why. So um, that, uh, that simple question is, is much more complicated because it presupposes that we know how development normally works, how you normally grow a limb, and therefore how you could regrow it at, at, a, at a moment's notice. And it also assumes that we know everything that's different about a starfish and a human being, and I think we're far from that as well. So the mission is to be slightly uh, Catholic in our attitude towards regeneration and think about this as an evolutionary variable, which it is, Think about it from the point of view of a zebrafish or an axolotl, which is a fantastic salamander. Look at this guy. I mean, he looks so unbelievably cute. And they are ruthless. They are cannibalistic. They eat each other's limbs off. And that's why they can grow them back so fast. 
So, um, and then there's this poor little fellow who's my particular pet, um, who um, really doesn't do as good a job as uh, we'd like him to do. So the strategy has been to develop not only a sort of a pan-organism approach, and it is getting quite menagerie-like at Emble, uh, Australia, but also to uh, take the view that you can't really understand biology by studying just one level, that you have to integrate across the organismal cell and molecular levels. And right now this is called systems biology. Um, I, I, I'm sure that in five years we'll have another name for whatever that is, that little triangle in there. But whatever it is, it's true that by uh, combining different areas of biology, we will hopefully be able to um, be better at finding drug targets, of, of being able to control lineage, and by uh, looking at for stem cell-based therapies, which is something that I'm particularly interested in. So the environment that we built was, um, it's very nice, it's very pretty. This is the labs right here. Um, this is a particular, I put this, uh, this picture in because this is a, a particular uh, pride uh, to us in particular to my uh, colleague Pete Curry who's here in the audience who is the uh, deputy director and uh, is the uh, king of the zebrafish colony. It's a rather spectacular facility for anyone who wants to work on zebrafish genetics, talk to Pete. Um, and the whole point of that is just to point out that you can't just put brilliant people in a vacuum. You've got to surround them with all of the facilities that they need because if you give them a modest amount of money that will f uh, give them um, the start of, let's say, three to four people in their lab, Mm, they'll have to grow much bigger if they don't have access to centralized facilities that give them initially at least the expertise that they can't possibly amass within their own group. So for instance, you need a good flow cytometry facility, you need a good facility for running your organismal work, you need a great microscopy facility, and in theory you need ANSTO, I think, and we're hopefully going to in integrate that um, into the armamentarium of, um, of uh, exciting um, technologies that we hopefully Emble Australia will have access to. So it's a new environment, it's a new research. The idea is to try to really pull this together in a way that will attract people. And we've been quite lucky in doing that. So here's the, here's the uh, current group. I don't know if I've forgotten anyone on here, but um, the two Emble Australia uh, groups um, who, who are here today and who I'll talk about a little more, uh, Nicholas Plotka and Eddie McGlynn, are joined by a number of more senior scientists who fill in, because at Emble we have senior scientists, but we start from scratch with just two junior ones, and so they have to have some friends. Um, we have uh, fish immunologists, uh, primate neurobiologists. Uh, this one is a mouse neurobiologist. That's the fish king right over there. Um, I work on mice and heart and muscle. Uh, Christoph Marcel works on uh, developmental mechanisms and cell-cell interactions during the development using chick, as does Eddie. Eddie also uses mice. Tiziano uses uh, human embryonic stem cells to study lineages and how that develops. And Nicholas Plachta is studying dynamic interactions in early embryogenesis, and I'll talk a little bit more about both of those. And the reason that we have such an incredibly broad spectrum of expertise in this institute is because I don't know where along this line I should stop. If I find someone who's wonderful at looking at macromolecular complexes, I know that eventually we're going to need that expertise. And so we've really just chosen people rather than subjects to try to start to fill in the gap and also to um, recognize the fact that if we have the right core facilities, where people sit along this uh, particular axis is, is less uh, worrisome than it, whether they can, in fact, use um, the, the core capacities and the computational expertise that we're trying to fill in. So I'll just tell you a little bit about some of the cores, because this might be of interest to you, given that Emble Australia is for Australia. It's not just for Army or for Monash. These are core facilities that we've set up because they needed to be set up. And um, one of them is, in fact, what's called Fish Core. And early on, Pete Curry actually wrote a, a very beautiful uh, review um, in which he compared and contrasted the various models, in this case, fly, fish, mouse, and rat, in in their capacity to model different kinds of diseases, different kinds of physiological processes. And um, um, it's not surprising that because he's a fish guy, there's a lot of pluses in that, in that uh, lane, and as there should be. And you'll notice that one of the beautiful things about fish is even though they are, in fact, vertebrates, they don't cost nearly as much as some of the fuzzier ones. 
So um, the uh, idea behind uh, using zebrafish is that they are wonderful models of, um, of genetics and they have a fast generation time. They have beautiful uh, transparent embryos so that you can follow not only genetic uh, traits but you can follow that during the embryogenic development. And uh, the, the capacity to use zebrafish as a screen for all sorts of different um, um, drugs and or uh, environmental stimuli or uh, just looking for particular genes for a particular phenotype relies on having enough zebrafish to do it in. And so we've really built an enormous facility. It's the biggest one in the Southern Hemisphere. People tell me that's no big deal. But actually, I was in Chile two, two weeks ago, and uh, they, they told me that, th that it's probably true. So I, at least as far as the, uh, I didn't know those fish did that, Pete. That's very exciting. Um, Okay, so here are some of the reasons why zebrafish are so useful, and I think it's pretty clear. I've said most of these things before. There's a forward genetic strategy you can use. You can also do gene-specific reverse genetics by uh, targeted mutagenesis. And for better or for worse, it's a wonderful tool for looking at evolution in vertebrates, and we're actually very interested in that. As I said, regeneration, like many other things, is an evolutionary valuable variable and valuable. So the other thing that we do in terms of animal models, which might be of interest to you since I know that this isn't your forte and therefore maybe the, there, some of these uh, core facilities might be of interest to some of you, is um, transgenic and knockout animals. And I'll just say that we have a very um, well-developed gene expression core. We make uh, uh, some um, very sophisticated constructs using uh, recombination mediated back uh, modification of genes in the mouse, and uh, we're now b branching out into the rat. And um, then we target these in ES cells and make knockouts or do uh, direct uh, transgenesis using microinjection. We have a core that matches that, which actually makes the mice. Okay, so what we're trying to do and what we tell people we're doing at this institute specifically for Emble Australia is to develop collaborations. And we really do hope that there'll be an opportunity to collaborate with some of you along a number of different lines. These are the more medically relevant things that we do, but there are a number of other much, much more essential and basic fundamental questions that we address as well. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about group leader selection, because as you can imagine, the whole trick to this, to make it work well, is to get the best people you possibly can. And how do you choose who's best? It's not always the guy who has the biggest CV. It's not even the guy who has the fanciest back, uh, background. It could be somebody who's coming from a modest background but has got star qualities. And so that's one of the things that coming from Emble, I've learned over the years to uh, appreciate how um, um, a, a committee coming together has to really evaluate these people. So we were very excited. We had two selections because we have enough money for two people in Australia so far. Two of these positions have been filled now. Each one got over 35 qualified people. Over 70% of those people were non-Australian. Most of them had never been to Australia before when we invited them to come. Uh, the candidates were interviewed in a very typical way at Emble. It's three days. It's very intense. Everybody talks to everybody, and we do a lot of socializing, so we know what this person's really what drives them. Um, and uh, we uh, got some very positive feedback from some of our extramural uh, uh, reviewers who were on the committee and said that they, they hadn't seen this quality consistently since they started uh, trying to get people to come to Australia. So we obviously are doing something right. And um, we were also very excited about the fact that when we pooled most of uh, these, or when we uh, asked people right at the end of the three days, would you be interested, everybody said yes. And in fact, I remember the last group, there were six of them, and they said, couldn't you just hire us all? Because we've already figured out how we're going to collaborate with each other, which is very sweet. I thought. It's too bad we didn't have six positions. Anyway. Um, the, the nice thing was is that for those uh, people who weren't chosen, and it wasn't because they weren't wonderful, it's because we only had one position to give out, um, they have, some of them have subsequently found positions in Australia because they were so taken by the Australian environment and the science that was being done that they decided that this was a, as good an opportunity as from where they were coming from. And uh, we were very lucky, for instance, to get Jan Koslin, who's not on my slide there, who just arrived, who actually was at the Max Planck in Dresden and has now uh, 
relocated under another fellowship that we were able to get for him because he wanted to come and work. He's a fish biologist and he wanted to come and work on uh, the neural stem cells of the zebrafish. Anyway, so there are actually three Embel Australia group leaders, one of whom is still in Heidelberg because he was uh, recruited under an early sort of jump start program where we had five years in some place in Europe and four years back in Australia hoping to get somebody who might not really want to spend their whole time in Australia. Maybe they'd be more interested if they could spend five years in Europe. And in this case, we were able to recruit a wonderful plant biologist named Marcus Heisler, who um, is doing beautifully. Um, he's actually uh, at, at Heidelberg and just got one of these European Research Council grants, and will stay there until he's finished with that, and then he's returning to the University of Sydney. Uh, Eddie McGlynn, who's here also today, um, came from Cliff Tabin's lab at Harvard Medical School, and she works on epigenetic regulation in mouse development and chick development and its application to disease. Uh, Nico Plakta, who's our most recent recruit, uh, came from uh, the California Institute of Technology from Scott Fraser's lab and uh, is working on some, uh, doing some beautiful work on the way in which early embryos uh, partition and sequester their uh, components and uh, how an embryo therefore develops asymmetries. And you can see that um, although two of them are Australian, Eddie came back from America. Um, Nico uh, grew up in, in, uh, fr in Argentina and France. And so we're beginning, hopefully, to develop the sense of an international collaborative group. And uh, obviously, we're very excited about it. Now, here's just a few pictures from each of those two people's work. This is Eddie. And uh, hopefully, if any of you are interested in talking to her further, we have some time afterwards. Uh, she's interested in the mechanisms whereby polarity is established along the head to tail axis of the vertebrate embryo and has discovered a fascinating new role for RNAs in, in um, um, regulating these famous Hox genes that are conserved from fly to man and actually uh, allow us to develop in a head to tail direction. She uses chick manipulation to under and over express genes to find out what's going on and how she can then uh, re uh, um, reprogram this, uh, pro th this, uh, this extraordinarily well-conserved uh, vertebral uh, sequence. And of course, mouse now cats allow you to um, play around with each individual um, gene or uh, microRNA and discover how this all um, works. And so it's a highly iterative process of molecular biology and developmental observation. Nico works on, uh, is, a, is, is very uh, image uh, intensive and works on living mammalian embryos, looking at early and later stages to, to uh, focus on the way in which different uh, key factors that control pluripotency and development are sequestered in the, um, in the embryo and the molecular dynamics of that, for instance, here you see an early mouse embryo in which only one of the uh, nuclei is lighting up with that particular gene. Okay, so that's just, I mean, that's just t totally in 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 inefficient to tell you in, uh, what these people really do, but you can see that uh, there's, um, these, are, these are people with a lot of promise and we're very excited to have attracted them. So what's going to happen to Eddie and to Nico and to others who follow, hopefully? Well, for one thing, they may stay in Australia, they may not, but the likelihood is that once they've been here for nine years, they might find it actually very pleasant to stay. Um, the best thing about EMBL is it's the capacity to do high-risk experiments because you can afford not to get a result for the first five years. In fact, one of the things that my director general in, in, uh, in Heidelberg always says is, I don't care if the group leaders haven't gotten a nature paper by five years. I'm more interested in how many nature papers they're set up to get in the last four years because that's when they're really going to produce them, and they do. It's, it's rather remarkable. So um, then, of course, we're interested in trying to deal with the you know, encroaching disaster of uh, the aging baby boomers and the onset of a number of really horrible diseases that are beginning to have extraordinary impact on our health system. But more importantly, I think what we'd really like to do is make sure that, that um, EMBL Australia helps Australia to branch out and to become as integrated and seamless um, a component of the international science scene as possible. I'll just say a few words about another component of our work. This is in the bioinformatics and computational biology area. And for those of you in, at ANSA, 
Ernesto, I don't have to tell you that data is data is data and it's just coming in in ever increasing amounts and it's overwhelming. These are just some of the databases that are held at the European Bioinformatics Institute and again they cross the gamut from genes to organisms and uh, you know the fact is is that uh, when the Thousand Genomes Project started at Sanger next door, Janet Thornton at the EBI was wringing her hands at the, at the last group leader meeting. She said, we've got more data coming in in the last week than we've had in the last 20 years. What am I going to do with this stuff, she said. And uh, that is the major issue. So one of the ways to deal with this is to diversify. And so EBI has already started to think about how it can actually distribute the load of handling these data services in these web browsers. And the idea came to use Australia as their guinea pig to see if they could put together um, a center that would help to diffuse the four or five million hits on their databases per day. And as a result, the EBI mirror, or the Amble Australia mirror of the EBI, was born in Queensland. So what we're doing, and this is early days, we're still only a couple months in, is to bring the most widely used data services and web browsers down here, make them available on a localized basis, speed up the access to these things by about a factor of 50, and uh, help life scientists in Australia to contribute to this burgeoning uh, database by actually putting data into this um, into this mirror which will mirror back to Europe and so the sharing of the data will become automatic and by definition this would hopefully increase the collaborative capacity of Australia and so um, this is what we're doing right now we're f we're putting links together we're recruiting directors we're seeking uh, new investment but it's been um, an interesting a collaborative arrangement involving a number of nationally funded agencies that have contributed to this, and I won't go into the data, um, into the details. But just simply to finish up by saying that our, sorry, our, um, our objectives were really um, to try to uh, sort of develop these collaborative models. And the best way to do it was to bring one that worked. And we know that EMBL works. It's been working really, really well for 40 years. And so our idea would be, therefore, to align whatever is already going on in Australia with some of the activities in Europe using EMBL Australia as a means to do that. And so these are just some of the ideas that we had around how this would actually work, and I think we're slowly but surely getting some indication that this will have some um, um, significant effect on that in a positive way. But there are problems, and here are some of the challenges that we face, one of which is, who's ever heard of EMBL? I mean, it's, you know, if you're a structural biologist, you've heard of Grenoble, or you've heard of Hamburg, you've heard of Daisy, you know, you've heard of, of of the uh, EBI because you use their databases, but EMBL sort of almost fades into the background, so it's been quite hard. I mean, I should have called it something very sort of provocative, but anyway. Then there's the other possibility, um, which is that we will never really be able to penetrate the collective sense that you've got to beat up people before they do their best work. And I actually don't believe it, because I've seen it work the other way much better. I spent 25 years at Harvard. I have been beat up. I don't think I did my best work that way. I've seen people come into EMBL and take off, and I'm envious. I wish I had had that opportunity. So the other possibility is to uh, try, the, I mean, the other challenge is to try and instill this idea that if you contribute to this activity, you'll gain back in a way that may, may not be in terms of dollars and cents or you know, some other very concrete uh, sort of just retour. The 20 member states of EMBL give all the money to EMBL and ask EMBL to organize it. And they don't ask for, well, Denmark gave 8 million this year and Spain gave 4 million this year, so Denmark might, should have more, uh, more students than none of that, none of that. It doesn't work that way. It's very hard to get Australia to think collectively in that way, and so that's one of our challenges. And then finally, hunting is a pack. This is a, a, a line from my uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Edwina Cornish, who said, why can't we do what those astrophysicists do? They go in with these monster programs and they get the money. I mean, CERN is an example of that. And I think that in some ways a common voice is something that molecular biologists have not yet developed and we're hoping that we can help in that sense. So here are some of the people who are involved in setting up EMBL Australia. It's still very early days. We're very excited about it. 
Um, I'd just like to particularly uh, thank CSIRO and the group of uni eight universities for their support. Kim Carr has been a wonderful support for this. He's been very, very uh, supportive, as has his department. Um, I'd also like to point out that um, Silvio Tiziani, who's here today with us, who's the uh, executive director of Emble Australia, is really the man behind the whole thing because he's been literally um, shoveling the coal into the engine every day to make this thing happen. And uh, it wouldn't have happened if he hadn't been doing this. And thank you very much for your attention and listening, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>